Ultimate Tour Stage 10 from 2018 continues now with American Lawson Craddock, who has quite a story of injury and perseverance to tell as it relates not only to this particular day, but really this entire stage, or at least 20 of the 21 stages of this year's tour. We'll get to that in a moment, but first, Lawson, uh, between Europe for training and back home in Texas, where are we finding you? Uh, right now, I'm in Austin, Texas. So that's kind of where I've settled down once uh, once all the coronavirus uh, kicked off. So my wife, daughter, and I, we all travel back at the beginning of April, or I guess end of our March. Uh, we've just kind of been here ever since laying low. But uh, things are starting to kick back up, and I imagine we'll head over, head over to Europe uh, sometime in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, I was going to ask. I know that's home base for the, the major part of your training. So back over to Europe sometime soon. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we, we really miss it over there. We have a great lifestyle and, you know, my, my wife and I are big fans of, uh, of being in Girona and being in Europe. And um, it's definitely been in some ways really nice to be back. Uh, you know, for one, we haven't been back to Austin in, you know, March, April and, and seven or eight years. And so we had no clue that our, our backyard even had grass at this time of year <laughs> so that was one thing one thing we learned but uh you know um you know we definitely would rather be be over in europe and, and the thick of the season and um you know hopefully things can start to get back to normal soon and, and when we do get the chance to go back we're really looking forward to that so are you mowing the lawn as part of your training program <laughs> uh I mean, not quite, uh, <laughs> but there's definitely been a lot of house projects over the last uh, oh, yeah. couple of weeks uh, that, you know, last couple of months, I should say, that we've been trying to kick off. Uh, training has kicked up uh, a little bit in the last last month, month and a half, and, and productivity uh, around the house has kind of been on dabbling spiral ever since that happened. But uh, yeah, I mean, we're starting to, you know, become more comfortable with uh, where we are and, and um, you know, looking forward to, to just progressing from here and, and getting back to normal life. We'll have time here throughout the show to talk about what's coming up in the next couple of months as the Grand Tours mm -hmm. begin, uh, we hope, in, in August, September, and also October. But let's go back to 2018 Stage 10. What do you remember about that day? <laughs> I remember that day was, was awful. Um, and I think it's pretty easy to say because I remember every day of that tour was, was uh, awful for me. <laughs> Um, it was the day after the first rest day, uh, we had stage nine was the Roubaix stage and that was definitely a lot of fear, um, for me just, you know, having a fractured my, my scapula and, um, you know, that, that the day before this, the Roubaix stage definitely did some damage to, to the body. I spent the entire rest day, um, just doing rehab with our doctors, um, I rate, rode on the train for maybe 20 minutes and even that was borderline unbearable just with, with every muscle in, in my chest and my back was so tight, I, I could barely even and move. So the whole day was just dedicated to try to loosen me back up and prepare me for the, for the start of the mountains. And um, I just remember being in a bad place on, on the start line thinking, you know, that, like maybe this is it. I, I got through the Roubaix stage, which no one really thought I could, and I wasn't sure I could either. And, you know, maybe this is the day that's gonna you know, finally get, get the better of me, but, uh, Fortunately, made it through, uh, and it was a big journey from start to finish. I remember getting off the bike and, and just being so close to tears just because I had pushed it so hard. Um, but, yeah, that was, <laughs> that was a tough day. That's when I knew that the rest of the, the tour was not going to be a cakewalk to finish. Yeah, and that, th this story is, is pretty well documented, but just to fill in the blanks a little bit, you mentioned – broken scapula, basically fractured shoulder during mm -hmm. stage one. At, at what point did you decide, even though you knew I'm not going to be much of a help to my teammates, I'm certainly not going to be chasing any kind of stage wins here, but I'm just going to try and survive and finish these next three weeks. When did you make that decision? I mean, I, I'd have to say that the second I got back on the bike after the crash, um, you know, I could tell immediately that something wasn't right, but, you know, I, I had gone through a a really tough year the year before and this had a um, pretty much the entire season through kind of sickness and, and injuries and, and personal issues and, and whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, and I, I watched a tour from home and, and that was really tough for me. So I, I, I put a lot into to making the tour team in 2018. Um, you know, basically started my training from, uh, you know, September of, of 2017. And, and that was my focus was to be back in France uh, 
in, in that next summer. And, you know, I made the team and I, I was so fortunate and, and uh, so happy to be there and, and, you know, to have that crash on the first stage, you know, I wasn't going to let that be the end of me. Um, but yeah, like I said, I, I definitely knew something was, was pretty seriously wrong the second I, I, I stood back up, but you're kind of faced with this crossroads, you know, I mean, if you can't finish the stage, you, you can't start the next. And, and at that point I said, you know what, I, I put too much work in here just to, to, you know, get in the bus on the, or get in the broom wagon on, on halfway through the first stage. And so just go as far and as long and as hard as you can, and, and we'll see where that goes. And <laughs> that's how I made it to the finish. And then, you know, we started the fundraiser after that. And, and that's what really kind of powered me all the way to the, to Paris. It sounds like the uh, cobbles there on stage nine were awfully painful, understandably so. Uh, can you pick out a moment or two where you most questioned your decision, if it was a good idea to continue racing and try and finish? <laughs> uh, on, on which day? Because <laughs> there's a couple, a couple <laughs> was it of every day? Almost, but there's a couple of days that definitely uh, stayed out to me. Um, you know, the first 10 days I was able to kind of really get through uh, – I was, I was really lucky with, with the way the, the profile of every stage was, the way we raced it. Um, it definitely allowed me to kind of edge my way through that first week. And, and, and that really kind of, you know, set me up to, to really help finish the, the, the last 10 stages. But um, it was about two weeks in when, when the fatigue really started to hit and, and the body really started to throw a big old fit that, that I really – had my biggest doubts about making it to the finish. There's uh, two stages on, on either side of uh, the, the second rest day. And uh, we finished in Carcassonne. Um, but I remember just, I remember that day just, just being in terrible pain. And, you know, we hit the base of the spinal climb um, about probably 40K to the finish. And, you know, my entire back and shoulder just completely seized. And I had to stop pedaling and, and uh, putting me off the back before the climb even started. And, you know, that was kind of a day I was like, okay, maybe this is it. You know, there was a big break up the road, which led me to time cut. And I, I really was not sure I was going to make it that day. And fortunately, I was able to and, and make it through the rest day. And I thought things could fortunately, hopefully get better from here. And, and they really did it the next day. I spent, I remember spending about 100K chasing with three guys, just about five minutes off the back of the Peloton. Um, and that was that was kind of, you know, a lot of thoughts going through your head. You know, I made it, I made it this far, you know, of course you want to make it to Paris, but can I even make it? Can I make it to the stage? And uh, yeah, a tough wide range of emotion, emotions. And fortunately I was able to, to make it through and um, limp through the last couple of days, but there was, there was a lot of doubt, um, but a lot of motivation as well behind me and, and pushing me to the, to the finish. I got to think, and I've thought about this a number of times, that no matter where the athlete uh, was from, we would have followed this story pretty closely, just out of respect for someone who's battling through that kind of injury and this kind of grueling sport anyway. But the fact that you're an American, we talked about it most days uh, on the tour. And then also developing as part of the story is the fact that you started raising money for back home for the uh, Greater Houston Cycling Association. You said for every stage you'd finish, you'd donate $100 to help rebuild this velodrome that had a lot to do with how you grew up in cycling and learned to love the sport. So am I correct? It's now over $290,000 that you've uh, raised there? No, you're, you're not correct. I think it's actually upwards of 390,000. So that, that is the better way of not being correct. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, it was incredible. Every day the number just kept growing. And, and, and I mean, that was by far the, the biggest motivation I had to continue. And, um, it was definitely a struggle and, and like we just touched about, it was a lot of doubt that I had going through my mind almost every day. But um, the biggest reason why I kept putting my, my foot over the, over the bike was, was because of that, that uh, fundraiser that we had set up. And um, yeah, I got my start there in cycling when I was 10 years old, uh, my introduction to racing. And, and I've always just kind of held the, the velodrome in the community in Houston just really close to my heart. So um, I, was, I was so happy with, with what we were able to accomplish during the three weeks. And um, I don't really want to go through that again because it was way too painful. But uh, I think it's one thing I can look back on when, when my career is done and, and be, be like, okay, that's, that's what I'm Absolutely, doing. yeah. It's a, a great example of turning a negative into a positive. So like any great philanthropist, have you been back to the site to see 
make sure that the funds have been used the right way and see that it actually has been upgraded? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, I was able to get back pretty quickly after the tour and, and they had already started to, to go to work on the velodrome. It used to basically be like riding Roubaix, you know, cracks all over the track. And, and you know, it's an old concrete track built 30 years ago. And um, they definitely had a lot of damage to it. And a lot of that was from Harvey. But uh, uh, yeah, they were able to start putting the money to good use and, and pretty quickly. And by the time I was out there, they had actually had a professional come out and, and, and really fill the, cr the cracks and, and patch all the, uh, all the, the damage to the track that had been caused. And, um, just, just then doing a lap on a bike, you know, half, half the size of, of what I ride, uh, I could tell that, you know, it's, it was definitely in, in good place and in good hands and, and things have, have definitely progressed really well out there the last couple of years. Um, obviously this year has been really tough. No, no, no events, but, uh, I think also one of the greatest things that we've had is, is the exposure for the velodrome. And, you know, that's, that's really helped kick off our, you know, a, a youth cycling league that, that we have down there. And a lot of kids are getting out there on bikes and they're riding in a safe environment. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really incredible to see and I'm looking forward to, to getting through the other side of this coronavirus thing. And then, and then seeing, uh, seeing what else we can do out there. Let's get back to the task at hand here. Stage 10, 2018, the specifics. Just before we went to break and we come back, we start and we came back, we saw Julian Alaphilippe uh, win the King of the Mountain points on that day. And he was, he was developing his brand a little bit at that point, but considering that he went on to win the stage that day and that he wore yellow for two-thirds of the race last year, did you have any idea at that moment that Julian Alaphilippe was really kind of having a coming out party on that day? It feels like Halifleep has had almost a coming out party ever since he uh, stepped into the world tour. He just keeps up in the game and, and, and progressing and, and, you know, winning and accomplishing so much more basically every race he does. And, um, you know, I remember that tour, everyone thought that there was going to be a stage in the first couple, couple first week or so that he was going to take yellow and he was going to hold it for a long time. And he had an issue. I remember uh, it didn't work out, but you could just tell by the way he was in the Peloton that, that he was pissed and, and he, he wasn't happy with, with the way that the race had progressed in the first week for him. And you know, that was going to make a very difficult race for everyone else in the last two weeks. And um, stage 10 was that, that first mountain stage. Um, and I mean, he did not hold back. He put on a show like he always does for everyone. And, and he really just set the stage for, for the rest of the tour. He was completely out of GC. Um, but you could tell that, you know, just, just from that day alone that, you know, what his mindset was and that he wasn't planning on stopping after that. So he was a main part of the day. And there was this other story going on that really kind of came to fruition a couple of stages later there in the Alps where it became clear on Team Ineos that Garen Thomas had a little bit more than Chris Froome at, at this point of their career, at least in that race. But we were wondering, we spent a lot of time wondering which one of these two guys is going to emerge and be the leader on that team. Do you remember having a feeling or, or thoughts about that story? Yeah. Um, <laughs> not really. I, 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 I did and I did it. Uh, for one, I was so far removed from the, from the Tour de France that year. I was racing it, but there was most days I couldn't tell you, okay, this is what happened in the race. I was so far behind it. Um, and by the time I got to the bus, I was just so mentally fried that it was just straight to sleep or, or whatever. But um, I do remember coming, for one, coming into the, that, that year's tour, you know, you could just tell that G had just kind of put it in a different level. Um, he, was, he was just dominant kind of all season. And, and um, I believe it was at Dauphiné or that year, the, the lead into the tour, he just seemed untouchable. And uh, from that moment on, you kind of – had this feeling or we had this feeling in the peloton that you know maybe there's going to be a hierarchy shift in in Ineos and um yeah I think that definitely came true uh in in that year's tour and you know we saw we saw them dominate um you saw we definitely saw Chris Rude maybe not at 100% top level the the top of his game like we've seen in the past but you know just seeing that that depth that Ineos has with you know constantly being you know two guys in the top five of every stage and, and knowing the time trial abilities, you, you know that uh, it's going to be that much harder for anyone to, to even touch them. It actually became clear at Alpe d'Huez. Uh, uh, Darren yeah. Thomas had more than Chris Froome. And as for you, I, I looked up your 
what you did on that day. And you were <laughs> finishing close to the end most days, but you finished 40 seconds, which is about 100 better than what you had been yeah. doing before and after. What was the deal in Alpha Wells for you that day? Yeah, I mean, that, that stage was, I remember it was just being probably one of the, the toughest stages that, that, that we could have done or we could ever do. We did Col de Madeleine, uh, Col de Croix de Fer, I believe, and then Alpha Wells. And I mean, those three mountains, you add any one of them into one stage and, and you're going to be in a difficult day. And when you do all three, uh, yeah, it was, it struck a lot of fear to, to a lot of guys before that day even started. But, um, uh, you know, I was definitely, I was, you know, a lot of fear and a lot of fear to myself too. And I think that was a lot of my motivation, um, on that day. But I have to say, it's probably the only stage of that year's tour that I actually felt like I could race. And that gave me a lot of hope going into the last week. Um, turns out it was just, a one small little light that came on and flickered and it was that after that day. But um, it was a day that, you know, technical skills weren't really all that important and handling your bike wasn't a big necessity. And, and you started on the mountain and you just ride, descend, ride up another mountain, descend again, and then ride up Alpe d'Huez. And uh, mm. it just required a lot of, I guess, a lot of power that day. And, and unfortunately, um, you know, things kind of came to, together for me. Um, mm. and, I was able to stick around for a long time, and, um, but I will say I paid for it dearly the next uh, next couple of days. <laughs> hey, before we go back to stage ten here, two thousand eighteen, uh, it wasn't a, gr a great day for the team you're representing. There, education first. Your leader, Rigoberto Oran, was injured. Stage mm -hmm. nine, the combos you talked about, battled through stage ten, but then would abandon the race. So, you're banged up, banged up, battling to just hang on. Your mm -hmm. leader is out of the race. What do you remember about the, the regrouping plan for your team after stage 10? Yeah, it was, it was a big challenge. Um, we all knew that Rigo was on the top of his game. He had just become second the year before. And we, you know, we came out of that first week. And with the, with the exception of the Roubaix stage, things have, have basically gone perfectly for, for Rigo and the team. And um, things definitely got turned on their head on the Rubé stage as, as it happens with almost every single team on that day. Um, but you, you could tell on, on, on that stage, uh, stage 10, that, that Rico kind of was, was feeling his crash and feeling his injuries. And it, I think it was stage 11 or 12 that he ended up pulling the plug and, and saying, okay, I'm going to, you know, focus on, on future goals, um, knowing that he wasn't at his best, but, you know, for us, it was, it was definitely a big blow. Um, you know, we, you lose your leader, and, and that and that's never great. That's never fun. And uh, but that being said, I, I will say one of the greatest things about EF Education First and our, and our team that we we bring to race is that um, I, we have I don't know. I think we just have a really resilient group of guys. And and yeah, we understood that you know our leader was gone, but that doesn't change our goals. And you know, that just means our goals are shifting a little bit. You know, instead of racing to to win the tour, you know, we we we're still a that point 10 days left to racing and and you know six other healthy guys that were extremely motivated extremely fit and and ready to pick up the slack and you know i think we saw that the rest of the race uh things never really did pan out for us in terms of of results or anything but you know i think pierre roland that we had and, and danny martinez in his first tour they really picked up the slack and they you know they raced as hard as they could every single day and, and so did the other guys so did everyone um to all the way to the finish. And uh, it's easy to get down in moments like that, but, you know, at, at, you know, at that point you have to realize, okay, we are professional cyclists. This is Tour de France and, you know, this is it. You know, this is as big as it gets for us. And, and, and that was kind of our mentality going forwards. We are talking with American Lost and Craddock about 2018, the Tour de France stage 10. We'll wrap it up with him when the stage is over and also take a peek ahead to what's coming up later this summer for him on the Grand Tour season. But right now, let's go back out to the race.